interesting. Um, so looking back in time, ancient Egypt, going all the way back, the oldest evidence of floral arrangements comes from ancient Egypt. So when they discovered the mummy of uh, Tutankhamun. There we go. That's why we have co-hosts, eh? Yeah. <laughs> when they discovered that tomb in 1922, they also found bouquets of flowers on the coffin, um, which, I mean, that's such an interesting thing to find out, right? So the Egyptians, they also used floral arrangements for spiritual purposes. They banish evil, and they help to ease the passage of the dead into the afterlife. Um, so using different flowers as kind of a mode of transportation, almost <laughs> going from <laughs> one place to another. Well, we kind of do that at funerals too, because uh, you know, and put them on the casket as it's lower and things too. So it hasn't changed terribly much. Mm -hmm. but, yeah, um, it's <clears> definitely <throat> a tradition that that has kept going and that we still practice today across many different cultures and I mean, around the world, right? Um, for memorials and funerals, um, absolutely. Um, uh, did, oh, I'm sorry. No, go for it. <laughs> if, have you ever, this is totally irrelevant, but the curse of the mummy's tomb seems to have been spawned here because um, there was, a, I think there was a written curse on the wall. And then the, the guy who opened the tomb, uh, Howard Carter, uh, he he was had mosquito bites and he, they got infected and he died from it. And that's, I think, where the whole thing got started. So, yeah, so you gotta be careful when you open. <laughs> when you tombs. open tombs, for sure. <laughs> Take I, care of those bites. So. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> definitely. So moving into the antiquity and kind of medieval times, bouquets were becoming really popular as decoration. They weren't just used um, for funerals or special events, but they were meant as gifts for both the dead and the living. And the ancient Greeks uh, gave women flowers to show appreciation of their beauty. And they were oftentimes uh, flower crowns um, that they would wear on their ha uh, head. Um, so just really beautiful decoration just to show appreciation. And into the Renaissance, bouquets made a comeback. Uh, flowers, believe it or not, were not always accessible. Um, so during the Renaissance, they really came a comeback. They were um, being celebrated and given to um, those around you. And the heavily scented blossoms were given to brides on their wedding day <laughs> to cover strong body odors. When yeah. I read that, I thought that was the funniest thing. That's kind of where the tradition of uh, brides walking down the aisle um, with flowers, that's where it yeah. comes from. I thought that was just the funniest thing. <laughs> well, washing wasn't big in the, in the, in the Renaissance. Like Queen, I think Queen Elizabeth was the first. Had, yeah, I take a bath once a year, whether I need it or not. And that was about it. <laughs> yeah. So it bringing really... in flowers just as, yeah. as perfume, right? Um, yeah. That's kind of a, another tradition that came out of um, floral arrangements. And into the Baroque age, the fear of death dominated every day. So it's kind of the opposite of carpe diem, which is seize the day and you know, take every opportunity and live life to the fullest. Um, we, in contrast to that, we saw vanitas, which were um, portraits or paintings or, and just kind of the ideology that death is inevitable, right? <laughs> um, yeah. Humans are going to die. You are mortal. Um, so what? fresh. What? <laughs> when did this happen? <laughs> New news to me. Um, yeah. <laughs> fresh flowers really symbolized the beauty of life and decaying and death at the same time. So painters and artists during that period, and we'll see some works from the collection that we have at the Art Gallery of Windsor, um, some Vanitas and still lives uh, that it was pretty popular Dutch painters and Flemish painters really um, leaned into this theme. 
Um, so going into the 19th century, the middle classes appropriated the bouquet. Um, there were more fast freight sailing ships and airplanes that meant that more and more exotic flowers were being imported from China and South Africa to Europe and North America. Um, while cut flowers had been a privilege of the nobility for a really long time, the middle classes now began to decorate their homes with floral arrangements. So they were no longer just a present, but they were an object of interior design and interior decoration. And I don't know about you, but I do have some flowers and plants around my house and I use that as an element of decoration. Feed the cat. <laughs> 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 See, even Alice, yeah, you have some um, some plants in, in your house Shamrock, as well. Shamrock, yeah. <laughs> awesome. Which I have to hang up high because of cats. <laughs> anyway. Absolutely. So that's yeah. kind of a, our little timeline of flower arrangements and flowers um, in art. And we'll, if you go on to the next slide, Alice, I think we'll yes, start to see some um, yep. I think we have a few more. There we go. Some examples of Vanitas. Um, this one is is one of my <laughs> favorites. Um, it has so many different elements to it. Um, just looking at it quickly before going into detail about the artist, I can see the parrot and the monkey. There's a pomegranate, um, some apples, figs. Um, some sort of squash or a pumpkin, these beautiful flowers, really rich colors. Um, it looks like it's in front of a window almost, and we see the background yeah. overlooking this yeah. really elaborate staircase um, and kind of a dark and moody sky uh, in the background. So again, the Venitas, right? The reminder of death that is kind of looming behind you. So you can kind of interpret the sky as, as being the reminder of death in, in this section here. But is it kind of also a statement of look what I got? <laughs> you know, Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm rich. Because at the time, right, flowers were not as accessible to everyone. And if you were rich and you had money, it was kind of a status thing, right? That to spend your money on flowers, you could access these amazing flowers from China, from Africa, from the Middle East. And it was a collector's item. Um, so they would keep the, the blooms, um, try to plant them in their own gardens to start, <laughs> start yeah. their own little patch or, or garden of flowers. And they would keep the dry flowers too and kind of display them um, as kind of trophies, like exactly like you said, Alice, look what I got. I have this amazing flower from a faraway land or a different continent. So it was definitely a status symbol at the time to have uh, these beautiful flowers. And even the parrot and the monkey, yeah. <laughs> that yeah. again, it just adds to the nobility or the grandeur yeah. of the word for sure. You got the box to bring these in kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, go ahead. I, I was going to talk a little bit about the artist as well, because sure. uh, they have quite an interesting uh, background. Um, but Abraham Bruegel was a Flemish painter, and he came from the famous Bruegel family of artists. Um, his parents were artists. His brothers were artists. Um, his father <laughs> was an artist, and he collaborated often with Rubens, uh, oh, which cool. is a uh, pretty famous uh, Flemish painter. And Abraham joined um, an association of mainly Dutch and Flemish artists who were working in Rome. So he moved to Italy to have access to um, not only other artists, but uh, different techniques, different schools, different materials as well. And he became a really well-known floral still life painter. And he worked and created these amazingly intricate um, compositions, right? Um, that are filled with symbolism. So everything has a meaning in this work. Um, so from the flowers that he used to even the vase that he used, 
a lot of artists would carve um, or paint the different carvings on the vase to symbolize something different or to tell another story. So this is full of different layers of symbolism. Even the building here, uh, classical, kind of absolutely Roman Greek kind of thing. You don't see that in your average <laughs> um, <laughs> no, Burgermeister's no. yard. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. But, uh, and all the exotic fruits, too, is like pomegranates, I think. Mm -hmm. Stuff that you just couldn't grow there. So, but um, yeah. And then we got like with the flowers decaying, like, is that part of the vanitas thing? I'm guessing it it, yeah. it probably is, right? You can start to see some of the blooms kind of wilt. So it's just giving a little hint of the um that the death, right? <laughs> the flowers are slowly dying um yeah. and they'll become dried up and kind of shriveled. But um oh, that's depressing. <laughs> it, it, what do you think about it, right? It is a little depressing. Yeah. Um, you know, at first glance, you see these this beautiful painting. It's rich. It's full of different elements. It's um, comical a little bit with the the two animals. But the more you learn about Vanitas and and the more you get into it, it is a little depressing for sure. <laughs> well, of course, the lifespan those days was a lot shorter. I mean, if, mm -hmm. if you made it to sixty, you were really really old. So yeah. you were doing good. Absolutely, but, uh, absolutely. The years, and you know, the Black Death was still roaming around Europe too. Which yeah, was, I'm guessing around that uh, time, eh, would it would yeah. um, still been happening for sure. Lots of fun. <laughs> Whenever you want to go back to the good old days, take a look at this. Don't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah kind of. All right. Should we move on to the next? Sure. One? We can. Yeah. Awesome. This is another really beautiful still life, um, kind of an arrangement. It doesn't have much flowers in it, but I thought it was pretty important to, to oh, yeah. showcase. Um, so just looking at it quickly, we have some different fruits um, from grapes. So we have green grapes, um, some red grapes. I think they must be apples. Yeah, I'm, so. I'm looking um, closely enough and we see these kind of leaves um, that are starting to almost brown a little bit or dry oh, out. Um, this really intricate vase with the scalloped edge um, kind of on this pedestal. It's big, it's marble, taking yeah. up space. Yeah, uh, as you said, Alice, it looks like it's on a marble tabletop. With um, a marble, yeah. Yeah, you can Sorry. The the shadows are really quite interesting as well. Um, so this maybe looks like it was painted inside of a studio um, in front of a background or a backdrop. Um, so an, another really interesting piece, uh, the artist here is Antoine Clamandon, and it's entitled Still Life with Apples and Grapes, and it was painted in 1870, and it's an oil on canvas. And this artist, Antoine Plamondon, he was known for his portraits. He didn't really paint still lives or objects or, uh, in, you know, in uh, bouquets. He was more of a portrait painter and he was more familiar with uh, painting portraits of members of the middle class in the Quebec society. And uh, he often painted um, members of the religious bourgeoisie, so priests and uh, vicars and um, all sorts of interesting people, right? Um, yeah, yeah. And, oh, go for it, Alice. No, I was thinking of Monet. <clears throat> he, he, he kind of broke from the history paintings when he did a, a picture of a burial at uh, it was in, in France but you had the lay pr people the priests and everything and this is totally different from um, what came before so mm -hmm. it's kind of like the same idea but yeah um, that's a good point yeah artists are always kind of changing and studying and they're traveling and looking at the world around them 
and they constantly have to evolve and, and change and update their work. And um, of course, artwork goes with trends too, which was looking at trends and what was in fashion at the time. Um, so constantly changing and updating their work to reflect the times. No, um, it seems to be Canada always seems to be about twenty years behind what went on in Europe. <laughs> was, <laughs> it got lot, here. <laughs> a lot of artists did go to Europe. That yeah. seemed like the place to be to study, to yeah. um, to live and work. And then they would bring this those uh, studies and what they learned back to Canada. And you're right, Canada is always a little bit behind um, kind of the rest of the world at that time, uh, especially in the arts world. Um, but he, I think this artist as well, he must have traveled and, and gotten different influences. Um, I know that he studied in Paris yeah. um, with a bunch of different artists at the time, and he was a court painter to King oh. Charles X. Um, so he was always surrounded by super important people. Um, when he came back to Canada, he retired just outside of Quebec City. He opened up his own studio and lived really simply. He became a farmer, <laughs> which I think is so wholesome, right? Yeah. He, he traveled the world. He met brilliant people and, and, and important people. And he came back home and um, just being content with his life and what he had. And um, during his later period, he turned to more still life works and painted this uh, really um, beautiful and intricate work. It's kind of like a tradition that carries on today with artists. Don't quit your day job. <laughs> you can't, you can't, can't earn a living at painting, so you got a farm or something. But, a backup uh, plan, for sure. A backup plan, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Should we move on to the next one? Sure, for Let's sure. See what's next. It's always like a surprise. Yeah. Oh, this one is a good this, one. This is cool. This is a really good one. It makes me think automatically when I see it, it makes me think of spring. Um, I think it must be the, like the little nest there in the corner with the, the three little eggs. Yeah, you got it, there it is. Um, it just makes me think of, of spring. And I know that those, those flowers are peonies. Um, they're some of my yeah. favorite flowers. Oh, they're all oh, cool. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. They smell so good. Yeah. They do. They really do. Again, this is another beautiful um, painting, uh, a floral painting. This arrangement is so intricate. We see all these different amazing flowers in this. Again, it reminds me of the one we just saw, that same type of vase on, on a pedestal. Um, this one looks like it was painted outdoors, maybe. Um, we see the sky in the background and if kind of poking through um, on that right side there, we see like a little hint of what looks maybe like a lake or yeah. ocean, a, a body of water for sure. London, Ontario, yeah. Well, mm -hmm. he maybe went to Toronto for this one. <laughs> Right, yeah, because he was, um, he's kind of local, right, southwestern Ontario. He um, was a Canadian painter um, that worked, and he was a teacher, right? He taught in London, um, and uh, so maybe this was painted locally. Who knows? Maybe yeah. it's a local scene. Yeah, yeah. It could be. yeah. yeah. Except for the marble pedestals, but you never know. Who you knows? never know because you know <laughs> there's the haute bourgeoisie of London. You got to take into Who knows? Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so James Griffiths, uh, he was a a painter. He was also a teacher, and he worked for a city council. Um, so he was a a civil servant, and um, I think worked for upwards of like. Uh, 26 years, um, almost 30 years for the London City Council. Um, so I thought that was pretty interesting. And during that time, uh, he painted so many watercolors and still lifes and floral paintings, and he exhibited his works, um, I mean, all over the province. 
and he painted during the weekend. That was kind of his, his hobby. <laughs> so as we just said, yeah. you know, artists, um, they would do it kind of as a, a side project at that time too. Well, was, yeah, he also did China painting and mm. I, I never tried it, but I knew a lady who did it and it's not easy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is a whole different technique that you're working with. Right. Uh, right. China. You're yeah. working on a glazed surface to start with, so yeah. But that's what I was just gonna ask, Alice. Since you're a potter and you work with clay and, and pottery, mm -hmm. um, how difficult is it? Is it tricky to paint or kind of work with glazes on clay? Um, depends. Like if it's an unfired piece, no, it's not too, as tricky. Mm -hmm. um, I think in uh, the Wedgwood. Student, uh, factories like they would paint the unglazed way or something sometimes mm -hmm. they, they, uh, what do you call it the highlights like the little sprigs that they put on um but the uh lady i knew and i've seen it on tv too they start with a glazed piece it would be a plain glaze like white or something uh underneath and uh so the 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 paint works a little differently it it can run like crazy if you're not careful so it takes right. a real real hand to do it and then if you add gold that's a separate thing altogether because you can add a, a liquid that if you fire at a really low temperature it turns into gold mm. but it's also toxic if you're not careful so, oh, no. <laughs> yeah. so you would do special firings and leave the room <laughs> right. and they actually advise that you do it outside when you're applying it or okay with, yeah so, so it's a it's very a, technical process then it sounds like it, it can be i mean it's been going since the German potteries of the what, 16, 1700s, and then Wedgwood started his up, and all mm. the, the potteries in the area, the five potteries they call it in, in England, Stoke on Trent, and those places. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and Wedgwood kind of helped bring the European style to England because it was, you know, they're spending lots of dough on the stuff from France and Germany and he wanted to, to take part in that. So, mm -hmm. but, um, and they're still going today, but mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's, it's tricky. It's like right now, if you look at a video, it's production, but it's with molds or, uh, right. and then, you know, but he used to pot himself, so he, he helped with the production at first and, and all that. So it was all hand done at first. Amazing. But, um, yeah, so I know yeah, everyone's um, going. That makes me wonder, too, <laughs> if if maybe he made that that jar or that kind of pot yeah, the, that the flowers are on. Um, that's uh, kind of a, the fun thing about the arts, right? Is yeah, that he kind true. of, um, it makes you wonder and kind of think about it, right? Well, it could have, so, yeah, you know, from right. England, it could have been, have been yeah. or from one of the French uh, potteries or something. Yeah, for but, sure. Um, he developed, I won't go on, to, but it's Casperware, <laughs> you know, that, that matte blue finish and the sprigs, that they, they call them sprigs, but the little figures you put on everything. So he, he developed a blue one and a black one, and I'm not sure if there was a gray one or not, but yeah, so he got pioneered all kinds of stuff. Oh, very well, cool. My hero. <laughs> anyway. I think the, uh, the next work too is by the same artist. Um that yeah. oh no, oh, maybe oh, not. I, oh. I skipped one. <laughs> oh she that might no. Oh, I don't maybe on my notes here. I have something different. Yeah, I do. Okay. <laughs> we'll go we'll go to the next one. We'll talk <laughs> about this one. <laughs> it's she a fun it. one as well. Yeah. Um, this one was tricky um, to find information about the artist. Yeah, um, I this couldn't. This <laughs> is a really old work. It was made in 1763. Uh, so to find information about works, it's always kind of like a treasure hunt, right? Which makes it a little bit exciting. Um, but this work is by Gerard Sanders. Uh, he was a Dutch painter and draftsman um, who worked in Rotterdam around like the early 1700s. And this is an oil on canvas. Um, again, really intricate. Um, we see all of these 
shining grapes, these fruits. Um, it looks like some apples or even some squash. Uh, these amazing flowers that I, I'm not sure if it's like built in or growing on this stone sculpture or carving. It looks really yeah. natural. Um, a little bit different than what we saw in the earlier ones when they're kind of arranged into a jar or a vase. Um, it looks like it's growing right out of the stone. Um, and this is the first one too that we see a figure or a person in the work. So that's kind of innovative as well. Um, it adds another layer um, to the idea of the Vanitas, right? That you know, humans are are slowly dying, and death is an inevitable. Um, so, adding a human into this work, it's it was kind of a little risky, almost. <laughs> In a way, yeah. And you got the traditional background here too. Absolutely. And they just pop in because like, <laughs> when I was doing the indigenous tour, and and you you had the first three where they were European painters doing indigenous scene and it looks great until you look at the background it's like i'll have background number three boom, straight out of the european school exactly yeah. yeah it's very typical of that time right the the kind of expansive background these really grandiose and uh, picturesque skies um the it's very blended as well um, it's a beautiful gradient, um, but definitely indicative of that time. And as you said, it was kind of, they have it on, on a roller decks, you know, yeah. which sky <laughs> should I use today? Which one am I going to use? And it's kind of copy and paste. Um, if you look at works produced at that time, you'll see some similarities for sure. Um, but again, just, just a really beautiful, intricate, mm -hmm. detailed work. Um, my eye kind of goes crazy. I'm looking at it <laughs> in a bunch of different ways, yeah. um, but it draws you in, right? And it, again, the symbolism, um, all the different meanings of the flowers is is quite impressive. I was kind of she using uh, Caravaggio, you know, the use of light and dark. Absolutely. So her face is framed and the fruit is framed, but everything else, there's a butterfly thing hanging mm -hmm. in there yeah but uh yeah so look at me look at my stuff <laughs> yeah again yeah again it's like it's showing off a little bit look at all these amazing yeah. things that i have in my, in my garden um so maybe this figure was a member of the nobility or they were uh, a member of the bourgeoisie at the time um so yeah this is another great piece from the collection Okay, all right. So, all right. Like, <laughs> we are on to section number well, two wanna, already. Is that okay? Oh. Absolutely. <laughs> um, we'll see how much time we have for today and um, mm -hmm. we'll see how, how many we can get through. Yeah, um, like, oh, yeah sounds good. This is a wild, good. like one of the earlier type roses where you've got a lot of petals but you don't have that shape that you get with the hybrid roses mm -hmm. uh bush roses i've got one in the yard that you know so they've been around a bit mm -hmm. but uh, anyway i'm showing off so <laughs> all your flowers that's amazing well my mom was really into roses for about five ten years and uh that meant I was really into roses. So. <laughs> <laughs> They're beautiful. Yeah, they oh, are. Awesome. All right. So in this section here, we will be looking at the meaning and the symbolism of um, flowers. And when I was kind of doing my research and, and looking into this, I stumbled across the language of flowers, um, which is quite interesting. So during the 18th centuries, Flowers became an on in vogue uh, way of communicating non verbally, um, which I thought it was hilarious. And the more I read into it and kind of looked at the different meanings and messages that you could send uh, with flowers, 
I, it just made me giggle. It made me laugh so much. Um, the language of flowers was documented by Lady Mary Montague in her letters from the Orient uh, from 1718. And during her travels, she learned about the meanings of blooms in the Middle East um, and uh, across Europe. And she traveled, I mean, she traveled the world um, looking and learning from different cultures and different backgrounds how they used flowers and what meanings they had. Um, we can also talk about the semiotic signs, right? So um, semiotics is, again, symbolism. What does something mean? Yeah. Using an image to represent a message. Um, so the iris signified loyalty, red roses meant love, and cornflowers indicated hope. So there's different meanings um, for different flowers. And you can see even on the, the image there, um, I'm looking at the iris up at the top um, right corner. Right, um, so the meaning of sending an, a bouquet of iris is I send a message <sighs> and uh, the daisy means I love you truly. Um, so there's different little ways of, of sending hints or, or messages to others through flowers. You yeah, can see how that could go horribly wrong if you didn't know the language, Absolutely. but the recipient did. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. And this has got to be, I think, my favorite part is that you could also not only send messages of love or appreciation for someone, but you could also send insults and accusations. Yeah, I <laughs> um, want to see those. <laughs> yeah. I'll have to try and find if there's an image of, or kind of a, a chart of what the, the different flowers could mean, but you could express non-verbally with the help of yeah. flowers, um, kind of your, your insults or accusations. So flowers enabled women, despite restrictive circumstances at the time, to communicate their social wishes and conflicts in acceptable ways. So I think it's the ultimate, almost petty move, right? It's to send a bouquet of flowers uh, to someone that maybe you don't appreciate or the, yeah. <laughs> that you, <laughs> you have a disagreement with is, oh, we'll send them flowers and tell them how I really feel. Um, <laughs> so I thought that was just so silly. So. Um, we're going to look at a few different examples of um, flowers and bouquets and arrangements of uh, different flowers that were produced around that, that time and try to figure out what they could possibly mean. Uh, okay. Yeah, we'll see. If we'll put our detective hats on and see what <laughs> well, you <laughs> see. Can... Yeah. You see poison ivy. Yeah, you're going to worry. I'd yeah, worry. I would be worried for <laughs> <Yeah>. sure. <laughs> for sure. Uh, this first work is by, I think, one of the most famous bouquet floral painter, um, Mary Heister Reed. She was a trailblazing Canadian female artist. She worked mostly with oils on canvas. Uh, she studied at the Philadelphia School of Design for Women, and she met her husband at the Academy, and the two of them settled in Toronto, and they gave art lessons. They were art teachers. Um, they traveled around the world, uh, visiting Spain and uh, France, Italy. They were just getting inspiration to take back to Canada. And they were especially um, interested in the colors of Diego Velasquez, who is another, uh, an amazing painter, a well-known painter. And they kind of took that color palette, uh, his same color palette, and brought it back and tried to replicate it in their own work. Um, she was a constant figure in the Toronto art scene until her death in 1921. And she entered an art competition in 1892, and she won $100 uh, because she had the best paintings. She won the award for the best still life um, for her work, Roses and Still Life. Um, we don't have that one in our collection, but it, it's a beautiful work. It's very, very simple. 
Um, but the judges were quoted in a newspaper article at the time, and they said of her work um, that it is more than an ordinary still life picture. It is poetry on canvas. Mm -hmm. And I thought that that was just the most beautiful compliment that someone could receive of, of a work, right? That it's, it's poetry, it, it speaks to them. Um, I thought that was just amazing. Um, so that's a little bit about the artist. Now, Alice, I'll put my detective hat on and we'll see oh, if we can <laughs> maybe try to decipher what she meant or what the meaning of these flowers could be. Well, she, yeah, well, and easily <clears throat> come from Ponce, uh, the French, with either two things to uh, think about or thinking of you. I think that's uh, the meaning be behind them. Um, now I, I don't know if we can go further. Like you've got a glass vase, two mm -hmm. like two glass vases, but I don't know if the heights are add to the meaning or if it's just to show them off in a different way. Mm -hmm. uh, you've got the nebulous background, you know, the, the indistinct background, so the flowers uh, stand out more. Yeah, it's kind of impressionistic too, in that you don't have like every little vein there. It's it's just like you know, <laughs> strokes of color, but you still know they're pansies. Um, shadows, they're the good old shadows, and so on. Uh, I'm wondering too, could maybe they represent two people? Mm -hmm. Um, because it, it made me think too when you, you said that. Um, pansies comes from the French pensée, which means thinking of you. So maybe it's somebody is missing somebody else. And oh, I'm thinking of you and remember when we were together. So maybe it could symbolize two figures or two people. Okay. And that one person is thinking about the other, almost like a, a portrait or like a photo, right? Yeah. That's Spot interesting. Meaning. Yeah. <laughs> Well, this could be a, a man, this could be a woman. It, it doesn't it, have to be. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it could, it definitely could. And I really like that you pointed out that is it's very impressionistic, right? We just get the idea and just like a little hint of, of the petals. It's not like the, the Flemish painters when we um, yeah. saw every single detail and leaf yeah. and shadow. Um, this is much more impressionistic, absolutely. Um, and Kathy in the chat says, I wonder why we all feel we have to read into something, uh, yeah, well, <laughs> into so a happy. painting. Perhaps you just wanted to paint pansies and absolutely, Kathy, you're completely <laughs> right. Maybe yeah. she had some pansies that she brought in from her garden and she said, wow, that would be a wonderful painting. Yeah. And she grabbed some vases and did a quick little study, absolutely. Um, this is For why sure. art critics give me the pip. <laughs> <laughs> they gotta find hidden meaning, which oh gee, I tried too. Wait a minute. <laughs> yeah. For sure, for sure. So Kathy, you may be right that um, yeah. she just wanted to paint something really beautiful that she liked, um, and that's okay as well. Oh yeah. We'll go, we'll go to the next one. I think there sure. might be another one from the yep. same artist. Absolutely. This one is a little different, a little bit more detailed, but again, from the same, um, the same artist. So it shows kind of her growth as an artist as well, as she's painting and creating more and more work. Um, this, so got this is just another beautiful, flowers, yeah. yeah, yeah, beautiful work. Yeah. Um, she was also like a, a feminist painter before uh, that was even a thing right, right. um yeah. at the time um uh, if you painted flowers or um bouquets um you know that was a subject matter that was seen as more suited for a female sensibility but mary really took that reclaimed it yeah. and she said if i'm gonna be a, a painter and if I'm going to paint flowers and bouquets, I'm going to be the best of the best, whether if I'm a woman, a man, or anything, you know, in between, I'm going to be the best um, at what I do, right? 
Oh yeah. Um, and in, in kind of the, the First World War, women just dominated the art scene, likely because um, many of the men were away um, fighting overseas. Um, so there was kind of a really big boom of women artists at that time, which I thought was um, really quite interesting. Yeah. Yeah, that kind of, it's weird, right? The, the men are away, we can play, yeah. But um, unfortunately, after the war, when the men came back, women got slotted back into their quote unquote traditional roles. Mm -hmm. But it's, and I'm glad to see that they didn't stay there, right? Because they, uh, they weren't going to be, you're not shutting me up, that's the kind of thing. But, um, but it, it didn't stick as well as it did after the Second World War, when women also, they worked in munitions factories and they had a taste of their own income and everything. Mm -hmm. That really, that really helped. But, um, mm -hmm. but I won't go on to it. But I just like I had to watch this film about Jackson Pollock. Anyway, uh, <laughs> and he was Lee Krasner. Yeah, he married yeah. Lee Krasner, and it was through her more than anything that got uh, him in touch with uh, Guggenheim and the the big bucks and the big critics and everything, and that made his fame. But she was to almost totally ignored till after her mm -hmm. he died and it was still going on in the 60s and so on but mm -hmm. it, thank goodness it changed mm -hmm. but uh, yeah so it was nothing new but yeah mm -hmm. but, and, um, and I found this um little article um in the Toronto Star that was published at that time um kind of a as a a, a critic or a review of Mary and I'll read it out because I, th I thought it fits in nicely what, with what we're talking about. It says, are there many women artists in Canada? What, what are they doing? What kind of pictures do they produce? Do they really work and don't just pose as artists that their studios are places with which to paint, not merely to pour tea for admiring friends? is shown by the fact that at every art exhibition, their work appears and holds its own in comparison with anything in the exhibition. There may have been a time when painting was considered merely a ladylike accomplishment, but that time has passed. All right. Um, so at that time, we are seeing more and more arti uh, women artists starting to paint and really hold their ground. Um, so Mary was a, a really important artist. And this is another just really beautiful, intricate work um, placed on this um, really impressionistic background. We see the details on the jar. It's this beautiful robin eggs blue. Um, there's a candlestick in the background with some smoke. Um, these beautiful roses. Uh, this is just a really peaceful and serene work, definitely. Yeah, the base looks great too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, <it's> just, <laughs> it does, though. Honestly, she did. She re managed to replicate the the sheen and the mm -hmm. just the the pattern and so on, which gave it depth. I think absolutely. It's cool. But uh, yeah, so Emily Carr had that issue too, didn't she? You know, they they laughed at her, they poked, you know, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Fine, she did get some recognition when I think they so uh, there was a work in uh, London, England, part of a Can uh, some kind of exposition where Canadian art went to it and so on. Once uh, somebody over there said. Oh, that's not bad. All of a sudden, our people are going, Oh, she must be okay. Right. Because Brits like her. Ah. So, yeah. Right. It yeah. Is, so, is um, women feminist artists before their time. Absolutely. Yeah. I think cool. we have time for a few more. Do you oh, want to go okay. to the, the next section? We made it to section three. <laughs> We're on a roll. <laughs> Amazing. Um, so, this section here. Uh, we're going to look at some more contemporary uh, modern works and really look at color, um, how artists bring in color into their work. 
Uh, this one is a, a really colorful work. I think it's one of the most colorful and bright ones that we've seen today. Uh, this is a, a print uh, by the artist Franklin Carmichael. Um, he studied at the Ontario College of Art and he painted uh, with oils during his weekend. Again, he did that kind of as a hobby. <laughs> um, his colleagues included Tom Thompson and McDonald and Arthur Lismer, who are all members of the group of seven. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so it's a little different than what we typically see of the group of seven. I think we, a lot of us um, kind of have those, the beautiful landscape oil paintings in our mind. So to see a print, it's something a little different, right? Uh, he shared a studio space with uh, Tom Thompson. I thought that was pretty interesting. Um, imagine that studio at that time, all the creative energy in that space must have been quite something to see. I would have loved to have, you know, visited or even worked or, or produced some work in that studio. It must have been uh, really interesting for sure. But he also um, worked as a commercial designer. He worked in commercial art and graphic design, and he made a lot of prints and worked with printmaking and inks and uh, carved um lino cuts and different etchings and wood engravings um and this is a work um i i can't remember if it was included in one of uh, uh a book about um flowers it says so yeah it was, I, uh, I, I don't know oh sorry yeah i don't know if it, if this one in particular but i i know that he produced a lot of different prints that were used in um nature encyclopedias almost okay, um cool. i might have to do a bit more research to see if, if if this one was included but he did do a lot of works um relating to the environment and nature and flowers and this just happens to be one of my favorites that That's <laughs> that cool, he made yeah. in it that i picked well he worked with uh, a company called grip i think oh, cool. And uh, almost all the group of seven, I think, worked at GRIP at some point. Was well, Tom Thompson earlier? Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, so and they were illustrated books and posters and things too. So yeah. for to to make a living. Yeah. But uh, yeah, no, that's cool. Is is group of seven like the landscapes are great too? They're, they're they are. Yeah, yeah, they really are. And this I thought was just so different. Yeah, from what we, cool. um, we're so used to seeing. Um, and it's an interesting process too, because mm. there are so many different colors in this piece um, that that would mean that he would have to make different plates. Mm. Um, so when you're printing, oh, really? you make one plate for um, one color, and then they're all kind of printed one on top of the other. Um, so it's a really intricate process as well to produce a print. Oh, would, would the place have to have a different design on them to match a certain place? Is that, I don't know how it works. Yeah, yeah. So he would have to make one plate for one color. So I'm dr really drawn right away to the orange. Yeah. Um, that really bright, almost pinkish. It makes me think of a highlighter, yeah. <laughs> a highlighter orange. Um, so he, he would have one plate that he would carve for the orange. He would have another plate that he would carve specifically for uh, the dark green. And then another plate oh. for the, the brownish orange, like the stems there. So every different color is a different plate that he oh, would wow. um, kind of line up uh, one on top of the other. Wow. Yeah, that's, that's wow. <laughs> that's yeah, it's a, artists go through a lot of different processes for, yeah. <laughs> for sure. It takes some time, definitely. Oh, yeah. It's, it's easier with pottery, but not anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I think we have time for maybe one more. Alice, what do you think? Well, one or two yeah. more we'll see what we have it's, it's up uh, to you you the yeah, boss this <laughs> <laughs> this is another one of my uh my favorite works from the collection okay. it just brings a smile to my face oh, it it is, you think beautiful. of of summertime 
Um, it brings me back to when I was a kid, we would plant um, some sunflowers in our backyard. Oh, nice. um, and just like the ultimate sign of summer, right? Mm -hmm. And see, I live out in the county. Um, so I see a lot of uh, sunflower fields that are just oh, yeah. completely yeah. full oh, of sunflowers. Wow. Um, so for me, it oh, takes me nice. right to, to summertime, definitely. Oh, wow. Yeah, I'm um, getting the squirrels plant them in my yard. <laughs> <laughs> All the yummy seeds for sure. Yeah, exactly. Uh, the artist here is Bill Wobchuk, um, and this work is entitled Sunflower, and it's from the Grand Western Canadian Screenshop Commemorative Folio, and it was produced Ooh. in 1983. It's a color serigraph on paper. Uh, Bob Lobchuk uh, is originally from Manitoba. He was born in uh, 1942. He studied at the University of Manitoba and after graduating um, in kind of the late 60s, he opened up a screen shop in Winnipeg. And it was kind of the first of its kind across the prairies. Um, it was really innovative at the time. And at the screen shop, he formed the Grand Western Canadian Screen Shop, um, which is kind of co a, a collective of artists. So a group of artists uh, working together, producing works and different projects. They produced two really important works, um, the Great Canadian Western series in 1978 and the uh, second series in uh, 1980. And it was really popular in Canada. Uh, numerous works from the screen shop have been exhibited in Poland, Yugoslavia, Holland, Norway, Japan, all across the world. Um, that screen shop was really like an incubator where artists could kind of test trial ideas. Um, it was almost like a, a lab. They would try stuff out, see what works, um, experiment. Um, collaborate on different projects and produce uh, new techniques that were used in printmaking and in the arts. Um, and I think that this work here is, is just beautiful. It's bright, it's bold. It makes me think of the Carmichael that we just saw. So those different layers of colors, um, just a really detailed work. We can see the texture on the leaves. We can see all of the little seeds, um, the sky in the background, um, just a, a really wonderful summertime piece. It's, it's, these colors are really interesting. It's almost like when you see a negative of, uh, of yeah. color. It, they're, they're very 70s looking, but yeah. Right. <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> so you got the orange and the blue, but you don't expect them. And yeah. Yeah, that's right. It is quite unexpected. And I think that's kind of in the spirit of the their uh, screen printing shop, right, is to uh, do the unexpected and be kind of at the forefront of printmaking and art at that time. Um, so again, just a, a, a beautiful piece to uh, conclude our tour for today. Look at look at us right on time. It's one o'clock. We did it. <laughs> That's so wonderful. Um, yeah. If there are any questions, feel free to put them in the in the chat. We can answer them, or we can also uh, you can also use the raise hand function, or if you want to unmute your mic and um, uh, let us know where you're tuning in from, or um, if you have questions, or if you have a favorite work from today as well, um, let us know.